you deal with the unions and things of that nature and you know you got to deal with SAG and there's just so many different things that you kind of have to pay attention to on this side that you never really had to pay attention to on the other side you know um certain safety elements that have to be adhered to here in the United States as opposed to how we used to just cardboard box it up and throw your ass off a roof uh you know what I mean that's how that works excuse my language this is an interview with Bobby Samuels. Bobby got his start as a stuntman in Hong Kong, working alongside the likes of Sammo Hung and Yun Wuping on films like Gambling Ghost and The Red Wolf. He talks about his lengthy Hong Kong film career, uh, a lot of crazy stories about when he was in Hong Kong, and also his experience directing and producing in America. Hey, first I'll just say uh, thanks for doing the podcast. Um, Absolutely, brother. I've been watching you for a long time. In fact, I don't, I don't know if you remember, I used to write reviews of uh of hong kong movies i and remember I, did, I wrote one on don't give a damn and uh and you emailed me when you saw it uh -huh. like, oh whoa and you told me about your you know your history and you know yeah stunts that you did in it so thanks for reaching out 25 years ago uh i can oh, finally man. repay the debt the, by the, uh, the, the, you on the, the, stunt, the stunt people the stunt people that's right that y'all guys man uh, y'all were the ones i tell you for marshall club and all that other stuff i was like the stunt guy that's right uh, so yeah, first of all, let's just talk about, you know, your upbringing and cultural influences. Sure. Um, grew up in, um, in Philadelphia, actually between Philadelphia and New York. Uh, my father was the, um, the first black banker on wall street. Um, so, you know, he was very wealthy. Um, we lived in the Dakota, same place, uh, John Lennon's, uh, he was killed. Actually, I was there that day. Um, I didn't realize the magnitude of who it was, you know, because I was so young. But uh, eventually, years later, I realized that it was it was John Lennon that was killed that day. Um, but, yeah, I grew up uh, mother and father divorced when I was two. Um, so I shuffled between Philadelphia and New York. Um, that's where I got my affinity for martial arts uh, in New York City. Um, 42nd Street, actually. Um, my dad, you know, by, by him being a banker, he, he couldn't dedicate a lot of time to me. So I was an, an avid Kung Fu nut. So I would just go to 42nd Street and uh, just stay all day going in one theater and out the other, just watching Kung Fu movies. A lot of Shaw Brother films back then. That's why I'm a huge Shaw Brothers fan. Um, so, yeah, that was my my, my first indoctrination. Um, the first film that I saw was uh, Five Fingers of Death. And from that moment on, I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do in life, you know, not just not just do action movies, but actually work with the people that I was watching in those films. And the irony of it is uh, the first big production that I did in Hong Kong was with Lole, um, the same guy that I saw in Five Fingers of Death that I wanted to work with. Um, my first big film was with him and a lot of other luminaries. So yeah, that was uh, that, that kind of came full circle. What was the the scene like in New York when you were watching these films were they were they packed or was it just you um, in there nah man I mean standing room only standing room only and I mean it wasn't about just uh African Americans per se or or just Latinos or, or anything like that it was everybody you know that was that was a colorless basin um there was no ethnicity when you walked into those theaters you know Everybody was just like one simply behind, you know, martial arts and, and the golden age of, of, of martial arts cinema for, for the United States, you know, and 42nd Street was 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 one of those places that kind of ushered all that in, you know. So, yeah, that was um, it was amazing time man. just everybody getting a lot, a lot of a lot of weed smoke in there and everything, you know. But I mean, look, that's the, you know, 80s, that type of thing. So but um never any never any drama as far as fighting or anything like that just you didn't even need, need to know the person next to you you know they would yell someone's name on screen and then you would know how well they knew that person by if they use their american name or if they said uh, oh that's that's gordon lau or if they say oh lau cafe you know then then you would know somebody who really knows certain things but uh yeah yeah it was fun man it's i was so fortunate what do you think it was that brought so many people to martial art movie theaters back then? I think that for me and for a lot of other people, I think that a lot was going on in the world 
in just in general, you know, and I think that those movies and because of uh, the the heroic concepts about how Cheng Che did his films and and other uh, directors that 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 allowed people to kind of live vicariously through those characters, you know. Um, you would see the same guys in the same films, five like the five five Venom guys, you know. They were in arm, you know, one, two, three, four, five of the, you know, they were different movies, but the same actors, but it was acceptable, you know. Um, I just think that people like to live vicariously through others. And that was especially for 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 a lot of men, you know, that was the brotherhood and the spirit of 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 martial, you know, wellness. That's what got us, you know, that's the part that I like the most. It's almost like a substitute for joining a gang, right? Because then when you join a gang, you're looking for that father figure. Did you guys, did exactly. you think a lot of people in there were trying to find that father figure perhaps? I do. I do. I actually do, you know? And then, then some people just, you know, admired the skill level and just wanted to learn martial arts, you know, that we can't forget that footnote as well, you know? Um, because that's how it worked for, for a number of people, you know, I, a couple of people I see to this day that, that know about that era, you know, um, and for them, it was, it was the martial arts. It wasn't like living vicariously through the characters, you know what I mean? Now for me, you know, my mom, mom, mom and father divorced when I was two. So I was shuffled between both homes. So primarily sometimes my dad wasn't around and I was looking for that, that, that male, male role model, not to slight my father or anything. It's just how life is. Um, and I found that in some of the characters uh, of the movies, you know, and the the funny part is that I never in my wildest dream, because I was born in West Philadelphia, you know, the ghetto of Philadelphia, I never thought that I would have an opportunity to pretty much know everyone <laughs> uh, in the martial arts film arena, you know, uh, from Jackie to Sammo to Yun Biao to Yun Wu Ping to Cha Yun Fai to everyone you know i even knew brandon Lee for a short time you know um but again that to me you know just means so much that that god blessed me with that opportunity and it wasn't easy the journey wasn't easy you know i would go to auditions here in the united states and wesley snipes would show up uh lawrence fishburne would show up at, at the uh, auditions and uh i knew that there was no way that i was going to get an opportunity to get the role over them so early in my career, I made the plan. I said, you know what? I'll just, I'll go to another country. I'll make a name for myself in another country. Then I'll come back and I'll have a better playing field, you know, because the auditions were annoying to me and the cattle call lines. And I just didn't, that's not an avenue I wanted to take for this business, you know? I just didn't want that. So I chose a very unorthodox course to get where I, where I needed to be. Um, all the while, when I made that decision, I um I started teaching myself how to speak Chinese and just learning the culture so that once I made that move that it wasn't playing catch up. It was like I had all the tools that I needed to to survive and make it. Um, and so that's what I did. And, and I knew that you could. Um, part of my plan was um, I, I wasn't working at the time and a bunch of us went to the airport and uh, they were all going to get jobs. And I was like, eh, whatever. But then I thought about it. And someone told me, said, well, you can fly for free if you work for the airline. And I said, really? I said, hmm, well, that's interesting. That kind of ties into my career. So I was all for the job then. So I worked uh, for a security company in the airport. And eventually, you know, I would greet all of the USA, US Air representatives every morning because it was US Air at the time. And they said, you're a very nice guy. Did you ever think about working for us directly? And that's where it all changed. And uh, the next morning I, I did the paperwork and switched over. And that first year I, I jumped on a plane when I got those those flight privileges. And I just went to touch, just wanted to land in Hong Kong just to kind of say, all right, now now the journey begins. So yeah, I don't know if I went in it or not. but <laughs> no, that's, that's a great segue because uh, when you were, you know, when you decided that you would try it, try your hand at Hong Kong, were there mm -hmm. any were there any performers in these films that you're watching who inspired you to go to Hong Kong? Where, where did That's, that idea come from? So I knew that um, I wanted to do Hong Kong films, not just any martial arts films, Hong Kong films. And as a black American, you always think about your culture and, you know, how acceptable is it for me to actually go to another country and, and, and be that guy? 
Um, but then my godfather, you know, who is my godfather now at the time, he was my idol, um, Ron Van Cleef uh, first, and then uh, Carl Scott, who's like my uncle now. Um, both of those gentlemen had prolific careers in Asia. Uh, Ron with Sarah from Carol Alexis uh, and um, Carl Scott with um, Alice Shaw with uh, Eternal Films. Um, they they both had opportunities to do multiple um, contracts with Hong Kong uh, films. Um, and at that point, I knew that once seeing the Hong Kong films with people of color in them, um, and then Jim Kelly did his little thing. I mean, that gave me hope to know that, okay, all right, I can do this. There are people with my images, but I said, I need to be able to separate myself from them. I can't just follow what they did. I have to kind of build on what they did. And that's where I learned the language, you know, the culture, the custom um, and things of that nature so that I would be more acceptable and not just viewed as a gimmick in Hong Kong films. Because at that time they were using a lot of, because I didn't know Vincent Lin at that time. I didn't know Cynthia. They were, they were, they were idols of mine. You know, I admired them because they were doing it when I wasn't. And I just noticed that, you know, they would always use them, but use them as gimmicks, so so to speak, you know, plot wise and everything. We would show up at the end with a little intro character in the beginning. You never see us again to the main battle and we end up dying and that sort of thing. I wanted to kind of try and break that stranglehold where you, we were just looked at as just, a, oh, just throw a Western face in there as a gimmick. He's a bad guy, that kind of thing. So that was one of my main goals as well, to kind of change the dynamics of of how we were viewed, you know, and I must say, you know, I got a lot of help from um, from Mike Leader in that respect. He was my roommate uh, in Hong Kong for a little while. He's a great guy, you know. We kind of all started out together. Um, extremely proud of what he's what he's accomplished, and uh, I miss him dearly. If you if you talk to him, tell him I love him, and I and I do miss him. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, that that was that was the goal to kind of change the image of how we were viewed, you know. Um, and so the funny part was, I didn't know Samo either. Uh, my first indoctrination in the Hong Kong films was with Chu Chi Ling. Uh, most people will remember him from Kung Fu Hustle, um, Bruce Lee, the man, the myth, things of that nature. I, I actually met him here in the United States one time. And he said, if you ever get a chance to come to Hong Kong, um, I'll look after you. And that was part of the motivating goal that I actually knew someone in Hong Kong that could help kind of lay the groundwork for me and get me to where I needed to be, you know? He repped me for about three years in Hong Kong. He got me some stuff, but not the kind of roles that I needed, to, not not the circles that I needed to be in. And I, I'll kind of share that 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 story later uh, of how that that went down. So uh, was that was that your introduction to martial arts, or did you come to Hong Kong with previous martial art knowledge? So I, my my introduction to martial arts it was uh, here in Philadelphia. I knew a guy. His name was uh, Maurice Tunstall. Um, he studied with uh, Jin Fu Mok, a uh, Southern Praying Mantis, uh, and uh, Sifu Shou, Choi Shupoi, Cheung Shupoi uh, of the Fu Hok Tiger, Tiger Crane System. Um, and when I went to him, I was doing a lot of Bruce Lee anecdotes and things like that, you know, and just just mimicking. He was like, nah, nah. He's like, that's, that's all gimmicky. He said, you want to learn real martial arts, I'll show you real martial arts. Um, and so he started teaching me um, Hongar. So that was my first uh, style. I studied with him from the age of, I want to say, 14 until my early 20s. Um, he then took me to Chinatown and introduced me to uh, Grandmaster Lo Thought of the 10 Animal System. Um, and Lo Thought, he was impressed with me and he accepted me as a student from that point. Um, but again, my my teacher wanted me to go into traditional martial arts because he wanted you know me to teach the school and things of that nature. But I I I just basically I use the traditional martial arts as a foundation for for physically getting me prepared for what I the career path that I chose. I didn't want to just be a kung fu teacher. That wasn't what my end goal was, you know. So it was a little disappointing for my initial instructor, you know, that I wasn't the guy that was going to kind of sit in the school and carry a torch and that kind of thing. Um, but eventually he accepted my wishes um, and encouraged me to to pursue my dreams. So yeah, my first uh, indoctrination in the martial arts was uh, Hongar. When you were taking Hongar, did you... Did you train Hungar with this sort of aspiration of getting into film? And did that affect your training? 
So I trained Hungar because one of my favorite directors, martial artists was a uh, Lao Um, I was really a, a, a nut with, for his films, you know, and just, just his martial arts and his family lineage and things of that nature. Um, that was one of the main reasons why I, I, I wanted to go so deep into it. Um, in addition to learning Hongar, I knew that for film, that it couldn't just be a Southern base, meaning, you know, traditional Southern styles with low kicks and, you know, a lot of hand moves. I knew that I had to kind of incorporate certain Northern aspects of martial arts in order to make myself look good on film. Um, so I studied, I started studying, studying uh, tension Pai Northern uh, martial arts, in addition to the Hong Gar, to kind of make sure that my skill set was kind of rounded, you know, um, at the time there, acrobatics was a thing, but it really wasn't a thing like it is now, you know, um, a lot of the acrobatics during that time were assisted with wire work. So easy to kind of do, you know, now with the advent of parkour and, uh, and like, say like the Marshall club, you know, or just, just naturally gifted. Uh, gymnasts and, 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 and artists, um, they've incorporated that more so into the mainstream martial arts now. You know, my nephew, Terrell Kota uh, Bullock, he's doing really well now with with uh, with big brother Andy Chang. And he's, you know, and he's always looked out for me. You know, he's a great guy. I love him dearly. He's big brother. Um, and, you know, he gives that people opportunity. So, yeah, I was I'm very fortunate in that respect. So you came to you came to Hong Kong. <clears throat> You've studied Hungar. Mm -hmm. You're being rep by Chu Chi Ling, um, <clears throat> very sweet guy. I took a class with him in Alameda one time. Yeah. Um, so what was the next step uh, in Hong Kong? You got some small roles. Um, mm -hmm. What was the first big break in Hong Kong for you? So I got some small roles with Chu Chi Ling. I did a Manhattan Midnight a film. I did a small fight scene in there. Um, but Shekin was in that film, uh, but they ended up cutting my footage, you know. Um, she shoots straight. I had a scene in there, um, but my footage ended up getting cut there, and they just used my image on a computer screen as a bad guy. And, you know, at that point, I was like, you know, when is when am I going to get the lucky break, you know? I would go to auditions and everything, and they say they like me and everything, but it was more gimmicky than anything. Finally... I'll never forget. I think it was like year, it was like the third or fourth year under contract with Chu Chi Ling. And my contract was actually about to expire. Um, I was in Jim Sa Choi and I go into a bathroom and I'm just, I'm, you know, do what you do. I go over to the sink, I wash my hands and I'm looking in the mirror at the guy next to me. And I'm like, wait a second, that's uh, Chang Hong Yip, uh, Paul Chang. Most people remember him from uh, Duel of the Iron Fist. He rubbed his nose, Ching Ching. Um, executions of Shaolin. He's always the comic relief guy, you know, hundreds of films. Uh, he actually was in the bathroom and he was like, hey, what are you, like, what's the black, he talked like a mafia guy, what's the black guy doing in Hong Kong, right? I said, uh, Lisa Gong Guadua. He was like, whoa. He's like, Lisa Gong Guadua. I said, oh, I'm mostly Gong Guadua. And so then we start talking. He's like, well, what's the black guy doing in, in Hong Kong? And I told him, I said, you know, I want to do movies and things of that nature. And, you know, he, I said, Chu Chi Ling is my manager and everything. And he did not speak ill will of Chu Chi Ling at all. He just said, uh, Chu Chi Ling is a good guy, but in Hong Kong, he's known as the Dai Yi San, which is basically a medicine doctor. Um, he's like, I'm going to, he said, tell you what, meet me at the Nika Hotel this evening. Uh, I have some people I want to introduce to you. Uh, so I left the bathroom. I talked to Chu Chi Ling when I came out. I said, I met this guy. And he said, no, 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 go for it. Go for it. You know? So that night I went to the Nico hotel and I'm sitting there. I'm alone. I got my photos with me, you know, and all in walks Paul Chang and Chen Kuan Tai. So I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So then Chen Kuan Tai comes in, he sits down, we start talking and everything. Um, then, uh, Chen Hong, uh, David Chang, Chang Dao Wei, he walks in. I'm like, whoa, this is like, like everyone that I've ever dreamed like right now. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little in shock, you know, but I got to remain cool. So he walks in and then uh, we start talking and everything. They listen to me speak Chinese and everything. They were like, wow, this is it. And then uh, Chen Kuan Tai starts saying, yeah, I'm working on something I might need you for. And then I look over at the door and then walks uh, Dai Guo, Samo. So Samo walks in, I'm just, 
immediately I break out in a cold sweat. Um, Paul does the introduction. Samuel sits down. We all have coffee. And Samuel says, um, I start showing him these photos I had and, you know, poses and everything. He's looking at the photos and he's going through them really quick. And I'm saying, oh, my God, you know, your mind is playing tricks. Like he, he doesn't like these. It's like I'm just so beneath his level, you know. And he says, can you fight? I said, yeah, I can fight. He said, can you fight four or five guys at one time? I said, well, I'm not you, but I, I think I can handle myself, but I'm not you, you know, per se. He was like, oh, okay, no worries. So a little small talk, you know, I didn't really know him that well or anything. You know, I was kind of intimidated by him, really, because he does have that stature about him. Um, and then he said, all right, I got to go. And so now I'm like really depressed because I said, oh, my God, he's the first to leave. He's the biggest one I wanted to see. And I just don't think I made a great impression. Gets up, says his coach as he leaves. Cut to maybe two hours later. Um, Paul's like, let's go, let's all go grab something to eat. Um, I want you to introduce to someone else. That night, my idol, my crush came in. That was Lily Lee. Lily Lee from uh, a lot of the show. She walks in and I'm like, oh, my God, I had the biggest crush on her, you know. Um, so we're all sitting down eating and the phone rings. When the phone rings, uh, Paul answers and it's Samo. And I could hear him saying, hoa, hoa, moment haya, which is no problem. Hoa. And then he hangs up and then he looks at me. He says, well, Bobby, you got your dream. And I'm like, what? He says, Samuel decided to change the ending of his movie and incorporate you. And I was just like, oh my God. Oh my God. You know, the big break that I was waiting for. And that was a uh, whole book type in uh, gambling ghost. Um, and so that's where, that's really where it all began, but it, it wasn't all gravy, you know, it really wasn't because that particular film, my first, I'll just cut real quick. My first night on set with that film, um, it was Mang Hoi, Yun Biu, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my big brother, uh, Colin Cho, Ngai Sing, everybody, James Tien from Fist of Fury, Billy Chow, it was an all, Chong Fa, all-star cast. And I'm not going to lie, I was a little intimidated. Uh, we get through the scenes, we're working out some of the action, some of the action I had difficulties with. It was a 16 punch combination set that I couldn't really capture, you know, and it took four or five hours for me to get the sequence. You know, uh, Colin Cho, he was assigned to me to help me uh, gain gain confidence and learn the maneuvers. Um, but every time I messed up, Sam wouldn't get mad. He would just go over and read his newspaper until I was ready. And I just said, well, my first and last film, trust and believe. I can't get this down. It's over, you know? So I, and I'll tell you what, what happened uh, as a footnote. So after I do that, we do the film. I finished two weeks early. Um, they owe me 5,000 US. Uh, so I told the producers, I said, they say, well, can you forfeit some of the money because we're finishing early type of thing? I said, I'll forfeit the money on one condition if you allow me to speak to Samo. And they were like, what? I said, yeah, I want to speak to Samo. Um, so they go in and talk to him. I could see him waving. He said, come over, Bobby. So I come over and he said, what's up? I said, well, the producer said that, you know, I'm finishing early. They owe me some money. I said, but um, I'm willing to forfeit that money on one condition. And he was like, well, what's the condition? I said, I'll forfeit the money if you just allow me to work with you again in the future, it's keep the money. He says, huh? He says, you're willing to forfeit the money just to work with me again? I said, 100%. He said, deal. And that was the smartest decision that I ever made in my life. Like you and I wouldn't really be sitting here right now if I let money and greed dictate me that night, you know? Um, as a result of that, I did Gambling Ghosts. I came back to America. Um, there was a, a year in between. I didn't really get any more work. I, I went back to the airlines and then I get a phone call from Samo. Uh, he was coming to New York to, to, to buy a property. He wanted me to meet him at the airport. I met him at the airport. I got him all set up at the property. Um, but before he went back, he said, uh, if you ever need anything, just pick up the phone and call me. You won't have any problems. Just pick up the phone and call me. Um, and subsequently, about seven months after that, I got a red pink slip uh, saying I was going to be laid off from U.S. Air. And uh, he was like, catch the first plane out. So not only did I catch the first plane out, I refused to buy a round trip. I only bought one way because I knew that 
if things got difficult, like this was it, you know, this was like, go. my flights were done. There was no back and forth anymore. Like I'm going to go, but I'm not coming back until I can make it. And I think by me doing what I did, that's, you know what I mean? That really helped. So yeah, I bought one way ticket, bro. <laughs> Just going back real quick. How long uh, did your scene take to shoot in Gambling Ghost? So that scene took about about a week and some a week and some days, about a week and some days. But the 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 problem with with that was that I was also under contract with um, Yun Wu Ping, and I was under contract with uh, Chung King Ting. So. I would leave Gambling Ghost and go right to Yin Wu Ping's uh, Red Wolf. Um, Colin Cho and I, we were under contract for that film. So we would leave one set and go right to another set um, for 16, 17 hours. It, it was it was brutal, man. It was brutal. It's the best time for me. That was what, 90, I want to say 94, 95, 96, somewhere in there. Those those were like the, the pinnacle years uh, for me. And then I stopped, I stopped, they stopped giving me, um, they started offering me regular movie roles as opposed to action films. So. So with Samo then, uh, so he brings you on to Don't Give a Damn. Was that the next film you did with Samo? That was the next film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, before that, um, I had been, and like I said, I moved to Hong Kong uh, for, a, for a, an entire year and change. I wasn't doing any films at all. My job was just to be his assistant, meaning wherever he went, I was with him, wherever he went, interviews, television guest appearances, newspapers, wherever he went, I was with him. Um, and I, at the time, I didn't really, really realize what he was doing. I was kind of dejected because it was like, I, I was there, Vince and everybody, they doing movies, you know, and I'm not really doing anything. Um, I'm just with him every day. But again, I saw the master plan. He was basically feeding my image to the public for it to be acceptable because it got to a point where I could just go anywhere. And even though I didn't do a bunch of films, they, they oh, that's Samuel's guy, you know? Oh, that, that's Samuel's guy, you know? No matter where I went, it was like, you know, the celebrity status came just from living with him, you know? Um, and that was, that was a dream, man. That was a dream. So give us some context then because mm -hmm. you you had been in hong kong for a while and before mm -hmm. you worked with samo you were sort of out on your own so to speak yeah. um what was it like for you in hong kong before being with samo versus being with samo uh it was it was grinding i'll say that it was uh some nights with empty stomachs you know um looking for menial jobs i washed cars in hong kong i dressed up as a uh, as Bugs Bunny in a mall and gave candy to kids, the big, you know, mascot thing. I did all of that. I worked uh, with Kim Marie Penn. I love her dearly. She had her Signal 8 security uh, back then and Darren Chevalier, myself and Winston L. We all worked for her, you know. Um, so, yeah, I had to do menial jobs before I uh, I landed the lottery ticket. I'll just say that, you know. So, so uh, yeah. Talk to us about uh, "Don't Give a Damn." Um, you have a uh, you have a big fight with Samo at the end of that. And yeah. what what changed for you performance wise from Gambling Ghost to "Don't Give a Damn"? Were you doing stunt training and were you working with his team? What was the whole process like? So after Gambling Ghost, again, I it wasn't until about two, almost two years later that, you know, Gammon, uh, home, uh, Momin Bay kicked Momin in. Bay. Uh, up until that point, I was uh, training with the Hong Kong Stuffman's Association, uh, learning different stuff. Uh, Colin Cho was in charge of training me. Like, like he's been, he's been involved in every aspect of my life. You know, both of us are born on August 11th, uh, you know, pretty much the same age, you know, we were both Samo students. Uh, I'll never forget one day, you know, he didn't speak any English, really. And I said, listen, bro, you you learn to speak English, man. You'll be a superstar in America. 
and then you end up, you see what ended up happening with him. <laughs> but um, yeah, just uh, basically learning uh, and preparing myself. Um, we would uh, when we were prepping for Don't Give a Damn. That's what so so. Everybody in Hong Kong has they hang out in like groups, cliques. You know, Hong Gaban with Samos. You know, Jackie has his own. Yun Ping has his own. Uh, and for Samos, it was myself, uh, Ngai Sing, Colin Cho, uh, Jing A Lo, who's president of the Hong Kong Stuffers Association, Chen Siu Ho, his brother, uh, Leung Gaiyan, Beardy, as they like to call him, uh, Cho Wing, uh, he's a masterful Shaolin kicker, um, and Lao Ga Wing. That was the Samo Gaban team, you know, and like, all bases were covered with me with, with that group, you know? And so um, Leon Gayan was like my uncle, you know, uh, he, he took care of me. Uh, they also helped me, you know, I was under contract with Bojan and, and they would come to Bojan all the time. You know what I mean? Uh, take me to lunch, teach me certain things. I used to, uh, I used to always clown around with uh, Leon Gayan because I was like, well, I'm trying to bend my fingers like you bend yours, man. I see you in movies and your fingers are so cool and all that other stuff, you know. But um, just getting to know them as as people, you know, Yun Biao and myself, every day we hung out together, you know. Him and I were just very close. Uh, so, yeah, that was the best education to kind of get me prepared for what I needed to. And before I don't give a damn, we all went into training. Samo, myself. Colin, everybody, we all just at the gym every day trying to get our skill levels up for, for that particular film. What were you guys training at the gym? Uh, basically, we would train um, uh, cardio work, a lot of uh, calisthenics, uh, hand combinations, foot uh, kicking, uh, falls. Um, had to be careful with certain things with how we did with Samo because Samo had a, a, a busted shoulder from... Um, um, was at Shanghai Express. I don't know if you remember the scene where he rolled down the mountain with the snowbank. Um, he tore his, his shoulder really bad. And that injury is kind of permeated throughout his career. So we had to kind of be careful certain times I would he would mess his shoulder up a little bit. But um, yeah, that's it. I, I didn't have really, <laughs> it's funny because uh, the whole time I was training, Sam would go back and forth to the United States, you know. Um, he would actually have to buy me clothes and shoes and stuff from the U.S. and actually bring it to Hong Kong because uh, my size, they didn't have my size over there and everything. So he was kind of like taking care of me, you know, really. It was one time I got really sick. We went to uh, mainland China to open up a stunt academy and I got I hit a scorpion and um, it didn't sit well with me at all. I think I got some of the poison in me. I had a, a, a bad reaction to my heart. Um, I started throwing up blood and, and, and bathrooms, blood and everything. So they hospitalized me and they really thought I was going to check out, you know, and I'll never forget it because, um, I had been in Hong Kong for a while and I hadn't seen my mom, you know, in a minute and I, I'll never forget my Sam walks into the, into the hospital and he's like, yeah, your mother called. I said, Oh yeah. She said, if anything happens to you, uh, that's my behind, you know? He says, so I sent for some doctors from 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 Britain, from from uh, Europe to come and, and take a look at you. And so he flew some doctors in from from Europe to uh, to t check me out, make sure I was good. You know, I was hospitalized for about three weeks. Um, and that was right when we were in pre-production for uh, Don't Give a Damn. So I was it was questionable whether I was going to even make it for the first day of shooting. But, you know, God was on my side. I made it. Fantastic. A miracle, huh? Yeah. I wanted to ask, too. So when when you guys are in pre-production, you're you're workshopping ideas. What what is Samo looking at when he's mm -hmm. designing action? Is he watching movies that are coming out of the U.S.? Is he watching other Hong Kong films? What's he's in, what's he inspired by? So for don't so let's just take uh, don't give a damn for for instance that him and I were big advocates of of, of American television and police drama shows. Um, third watch, and then I think it was one other Stephen Boschko show that was very popular at that time, New York NYPD, something of that. But that's the catalyst behind Don't Don't Give a Damn. He wanted that, and it was the staccato way in which they filmed the scenes too. He wanted to incorporate that, and so that TV series by Stephen Boschko 
was was a big influence on Samo with uh, Don't Give a Damn. The problem with Don't Give a Damn, um, I'll share this because I've already spoke with Rick Myers about it. I've, I've talked about it for many times is that, you know, that film marked a comeback for Samo because prior to that, um, business wasn't good for Samo. Film business wasn't. And he was having a little difficulty raising funds for films. Um, and I would sit with him talking with investors from Macau and Japan and things like that, you know, trying to gain money for films. Um, so it was it was it was a, it was a little rough patch for Samo at that time. Um, but the funding source came through. But along with the funding source, the writer for for Don't Give a Damn. He was related to the big guy, big guy who funded the movie. And there were racial overtones with how he just looked at blacks in general. And I could tell that, you know, from talking with them, from the meetings, from just reading some of the stuff that he had kind of put together in the script, you know, um, as an American, African-American, I felt like, uh, I don't think that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? And so that there were some scenes in there that were very questionable. Um, one, one in particular scene was really bad. That particular day, Samuel wasn't there. He wasn't there when they were shooting that scene. He didn't even really know about that scene until it was actually shot. Like that was one film where he really didn't have total control over the film. Um, and so I guess, and that's where the cultures come in. You know what I mean? Some sometimes Asians view blacks in a certain way based on the media and the horror stories that they they hear from the United States. Um, and without any thought, they just incorporate these sensationalized facts into their their story structures and dialogues. Now, whether they are true or not, that's not the issue. It's that it's it's it, they're talking about it in America. So it's got to be true, that sort of thing. And so let's put it in here and that's where my problem came in you know um i had to uh it was it was a little uncomfortable you know um so the only thing i could do at that point because a lot of people kept asking me is sam a racist and i had to kind of like tell them no he's not a racist um there's a series of things and events that took place that led up to the subject matter and how it was illustrated and things of that nature um and so that's that's the, the bad part. However, don't give a damn. My character was kind of thought out. It wasn't just gimmicky. You actually saw me in the beginning, the middle and the end. And I had dialogue and it was a thought out character. Um, so for that, you know, I give Sam a respect because he looked out for me in that respect. I think a lot of us assumed this, Bobby, because, you know, we saw Gambling Ghost. We saw Sam working with, you know, Westerners a lot. I mean, that's kind yeah. of like the Golden Harvest legacy. Is yeah. that they were mm -hmm. trying to appeal to Japan? They were trying mm -hmm. to appeal to America, so they cast, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. foreigners as main characters a lot of the time too. So yeah, um, yeah, something never quite felt right. So thank you for clearing the record on that for a lot of us. Um, yeah, but I think I don't think any of us ever thought for a second that uh, that was in Samo's heart there. So and and the the funny part I'll say is the night that it premiered in Hong Kong. <laughs> real funny story, real quick was um. We were in the in. This is right when "Don't Give a Damn" was being made. Uh, Samuel calls me into the office and he says, uh, "I need to talk to you." I was like, "Yeah, what's going on?" He says, um, "I talked to Jackie last night. Um, I told he he asked me if he could use you for Rumble in the Bronx. I told him, yeah, no worries, you got it.'" And I was like, "Oh my God, Yun Wu Ping, Samo, now Jackie, right?" So I'm cool. Everything's cool in the gang. Sam was like, "Get you know, go home, get your stuff together, you know." You're, you're, he's going to use you and this and that. And I gave permission and all. The next day I go into the office. <laughs> it's funny. I go into the office the next day. Sam was like, right, Bobby, voila, come inside. So I go inside, I get his coffee, hand him his coffee. Say, and I'm extra nice to him today because like, I'm thinking, I'm like, uh, yes, I go. What can I do for you? You know? He's like, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Last night, Jackie pissed me off. Ah, he, yeah, yeah. Now, you, you're not doing the movie. He, he made me mad. You're not doing the movie. So I'm looking at him like, I don't want him to read my, my reaction. You know what I mean, bro? And I'm, I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay, no problem, Daga. Moment, Daga, you know? But in my heart of heart, I'm like, yo, you just knocked me out of the triple threat. 
but I I follow Hong Gaban, you know, Samo. So I wouldn't be where I'm at if it's not for him. I'm not gonna go against him, you know what I mean? So, and when I did other films, like when I worked for Yun Wu Ping, I had to get permission from Samo. Samo has to bless me before I can do other jobs. So the funny part was that with both films, Rumble in the Bronx and Don't Give a Damn, open up the same day in Hong Kong, side by side at the box office. So I was just looking, I, when, I, when I walked up, I'm looking, I'm like, oh my God, I could have had the double bill that day, you know? But it just wasn't in the cards, you know? And I accepted it, so. So when you worked on uh, Red Wolf, um did you have uh did you have a team at that point that you were going with can you tell us about that yeah so uh talking with 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 mike leader mike miller um uh mike lampert Habby heskey roy filler diane i can't think of her name she was uh ming now stunt double in uh the jean claude man anyway I was pretty much established with Samuel at that point, you know, and I, I wanted to kind of use my leverage, um, but I didn't want to do it in a gimmicky way. So I'm like, we got to change how things are being done. You know, they're using us as gimmicks. We have to change that whole structure. And so Samo was like, I support you on that. He was like, see if you can kind of get some people together and just get signed to a, uh, a production company. You know, at that time it was art house productions. They were pretty solid. They, they uh, repped uh, Yam Datwa, Simon Yam at the time. Um, so they were, they were pretty established. And so I went in there with the ideas telling them to say, look, you know, we all want to kind of join together and be signed as one. And that way you guys can make money off of all of us, you know? Um, and art started. Art House started thinking about that, and it was like we've never really signed Westerners to like a a, a contract. That would be interesting. And I said, yeah, uh, we can do it as a, as like the first stunt team. You know what I mean? And they were like, oh, that's interesting. And they signed us. So that was real cool. What was that called the um, the G Seven? I saw it on IMDb. Yeah, that was a uh, Guaylo Seven. I um. They, they signed us and immediately we started getting work. Roy Filler got Ford modeling work, you know, all of us got different print work and, and different films. And uh, it was just, the first film that we did collectively was um, the Red, um, I'm sorry, the Red Wolf, Yin Wu Ping. So. Yeah, let's talk about first, that. Movie. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, Speed on a Boat. <laughs> yeah, that was like a very Western film in, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. yeah, what was it like working with uh, Yun Woo Ping? Wow. He's different, you know, just the different style of filmmaking, the different style of, of action. Um, it was it was just a unique experience. Um, Yun Woo Ping's style is different from Samo's, uh, but Yun Woo Ping is very, very innovative. Like, he'll walk into an area and just start coming up with stuff. He'll call his brothers in because uh, most of mostly all the Yun clan kind of works behind the scenes on it. Uh, Yun Shin Yi would come over and they would start thinking about things and designing things, and and it's just it's just a different vibe, you know. Uh, where Yun Yun Wu Ping and I worked well together was that he knew I was Samos Todai, his student, um, and Yun Wu Ping is the the godfather of Samos children, so there's there's history there, and he kind of looked out for me, and and at one one point I was upset in uh red wolf because i didn't get the crisp action that i wanted you know what i mean but i had to respect what yimu ping did because he was like let 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 them do the action he was like your character's more thought out you know i have you as the lead villain i have you chasing the guy around i have you other scenes outside you'll have action pieces but i want your character throughout the film and he really did he gave me a better a good character uh so that i can delve into acting wise uh, and, but his thing was um, he smoked marble lights, same same as I smoked marble lights. But uh, I had this patch of hair on my head um, that I was filming don't, from Don't Give a Damn and shooting. I had to kind of keep the same hairstyle. And Yu Wu Ping thought that was the funniest thing in the world. He would come over every day and like put his hands in my hair like this and like, yeah, it's very interesting, Bobby. Very interesting, right? And I'm looking at him and I'm like, Sikina, 
because uh, basically he wants a cigarette. He takes a cigarette and he says, yeah. And and here's the funny part. He says, yeah, they, they, they want me to do a film in America. You know, I was thinking about it, but, you know, I'm not certain if I should do it. I said, listen, if they if they want you to do a film in America, by all means, do it. I said, crossing that market, getting over that hump. Trust me, you will be golden in America. He said, yeah, it's a, it's a film with these two brothers and um, it's called uh, it's a Matrix, Matrix, you know. I'm not certain if I'll do it or not, but you know, you never know. And I'm like, yeah, I think you should do it. I think you should do it. And then look, look what ended up happening, you know? So. Can you talk about any of the other um, stuntmen in uh, Red Wolf, like Cho Wing? Oh uh, um, yeah, Cho Wing. I mean, he's got, he's just like a stand-up. So Cho, Wing, Cho Wing is part of uh, Samo's team and Yu Mu Ping's team. He floated between both. Um, exceptional kicker exceptional kicker i never i remember many nights i would tell him please teach me how to kick like that you know and like he, he plays soccer a lot you know and so i'll never forget it it was him and leon cayenne and me and i'm the goalkeeper right and i'm trying to block the ball from going in the goal and so Cho Wing said okay i'm gonna kick the ball and you block it let me tell you something and i and i and i'll be quite honest with you right now eric Cho Wing has to be the most powerful kicker i've ever been kicked at like he kicked that ball that ball traveled about 30 feet before it hit me and it hit me so hard it knocked me back into the goal post that's how hard of a kicker cho wing is i mean probably one of the most powerful kickers i've had a chance to work with um so yeah he's he's the real deal He's the real deal. I've been, I mean, you know, Wang Jan Lee is very good. You know, I've seen him uh, for precision. Wang Jan Lee is like the man. But for just ultimate power with his kicks, I would have to say it would be Cho Wing. Now, as far as butter, margarine, I would have to give that to Colin Cho. He's very tall like an American, but his leg work is insane. I was standing there when he was, uh, because... He was shooting a Jung Lam Hoi Bo Biu while we were filming Don't Give a Damn in that, which is a bodyguard from Beijing, Corey Yun. And so he was saying, Bobby, come on. I, I want to introduce you to Jet Li and Corey and the guys, you know. Um, so I would go to set. And I was actually there that day when they were in the basement filming that scene. And he was doing all the legwork and everything. I'm standing right there on the side with uh, Yun Duck. But um, yeah, man, again, Cho Wing, powerful guy. Uh, so at that time in Hong Kong, it's 1995, or I guess you're shooting around 1994, 1995. Mm -hmm. uh, the handover is coming up when Great Britain will lose its lease on Hong Kong. Did yep. you detect any kind of sentiments, any kinds of, you know, what, what was the air like? So that was a tough time. That was a tough time because the, the takeover was fast approaching. Um, I'll never forget it because the business kind of started drying up. I noticed that Sam and I were taking a lot of trips to mainland China uh, for business. And I started noticing the paradigm start to shift. And I'll never forget it. We were, I think it was 90, let's say late 95, early 96. We were at the airport and we were picking up uh, his son, Sammy, coming in from college. And he was like, Bobby, he's like, how much longer do you want to stay here in Hong Kong? You know, he says, I'm not telling you, you have to leave. He's like, but like, you've done a lot, you know, and do you really want to stay here until like you played yourself completely out? Or do you want to take what I've shown you and given you and go back to the United States and, and, and make the name for yourself then? And it was a tough call, you know. He was like, you know, the business is changing. No one knows what's going to happen when the when the takeover happens. So it was it was a very unusual time. And I told him that I would I would end up I'll, I'm going to go back. You know what I mean? I had been there for a while and see my family, and I just wanted to kind of go back and test the waters in America, see see if what I had done in Asia actually made a mark, so to speak. Do you think that some of that uh, uncertainty um, kind of percolated into the action design at the time? You know, don't give a damn, for example, it's it's a grittier kind of style of action. The filmmaking is a little bit um, it's a little bit more not experimental necessarily, but it's a, it's less 
situated than what it had been in the early 90s for example experimental was a good way to say it though you know because it, it was it was something we had not tried before with the the visual elements and things like that and just the the overall structure it was just different um so yeah experiment is a, is a good way um but we did notice that there was a change you know and the companies weren't shooting as much anymore and like days would go by and like things were drying up really drying up and so I I left. I left and I came back, you know. Um I the irony was that when when I left, I had, uh, I actually just did uh my mistress my wife uh which was um the first time they allowed an African American to ever have an on-screen romance uh with an Asian female, you know. Um and I played a psychiatrist where I help a married couple or something. Just no action at all, just drama, you know. So I was very honored to have been able to kind of move from action films into mainstream films. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it, there there is definitely an arc in Hong Kong cinema yeah. from that yeah. you know that early '80s period, and it's cool to and, see Samo really guiding that and you writing that. It's cool. And so the funny part was when I when I did come back, I did a small film. It was called um, Ultimate Master, early Ultimate Master. Um, and I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in the van outside in front. Um, I had to kind of get used to the American system of business because I've been working in Hong Kong. I never really had a career in America. So like, this is it. This is starting here now, you know. Um, but Hong Kong kind of trained me, you know. I was used to 16, 17 hour days. They were ready to crash and burn in 12. You know what I mean? So I knew that I was I was capable for this. But I was sitting and how I knew things were working for me was when that first day I'm sitting in the van and then I'm looking and three guys are walking up down the street and I'm looking at them and I recognize them immediately. And I'm like, yo, that's uh and before I could say it, the one guy goes, yo, Bobby Samuels. And I'm like, what the f it was Adam Yap from the Beastie Boys. It was the Beastie Boys. They were huge martial arts movie fans and they were fans of mine. And they actually heard that I was in town filming. And so they were actually came down to the set just to meet me. And at that point, I, I, I didn't even realize how popular my films were on the underground in the United States, because that's primarily how the Hong Kong scene was playing at that time. You know, VHS tapes, the underground bootleggers, that kind of thing. Um, and then I was like, you guys know me? They was like, oh, yeah, man, big fans. We watch such and such, such, such. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. This is really incredible. And from there, it just, every Everywhere I went from there, just like everything went up. I ended up meeting uh, Nick Quested. He was the number number one music video director during that time with Hype Williams. And uh, he did a lot of music videos. Um, he was a big martial arts movie fan. I ended up contracting with uh, Goldcrest and um, did a number of music videos with, with, with him. Um, and then he introduced me to Drew Hill during the rush hour phase. Um, and I ended up becoming uh, the trainer for, for the group and traveled across the country with them uh, doing their music videos and uh, things of that nature. I brought Lo Mong in a couple of times in Europe and things of that nature. So, Yeah, I want to talk about Lo Mong when you're, when you're um, in your indie yeah. section. But before we leave Hong Kong, um, I have two questions. First one, a quick one. Um, and I always like asking this question because mm -hmm. so many of us in the indie world always want to know how long these fights take to shoot. How long does it take for your scene to shoot in Don't Give a Damn? So the the end fight in Don't Give a Damn was extremely difficult. The three-way fight. The timing for that three-way battle. I don't know if you saw the overhead shot. You can see the movement between myself, Samuel, and I saying that took about four days just to get that one section um, for the timing. In that, what you don't see is I lost a tooth. Nai Singh had his nose broke. Those are the things you don't see. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, there's one scene where you see Nai Singh's head go back and you see a trickle of blood come. That's real. I kicked him in his nose. <laughs> you know? Um, and they kept yeah. it. They kept it. Absolutely. Realism. And to this day, when I, when I film, that kind of always comes into mind. So I recently did a Shadow Fist 2 and actually got clocked in the grill. Clocked so hard, it just knocked me across the room. And I use that scene as opposed to the pre-range scene because it's so realistic. You know what I mean? So yeah, 
that works. <laughs> what? I, I mean, you, we're, sorry, we're, we're, I'm sorry, real quick, funny thing on Don't Give a Damn. So right when that scene was coming in, right, th there's a scene where I jump up on the rafter, grab it and turn, boom, kick. Uh, and then Samuel kicks me through the door. I get up and we have a series of punches. I would do the punches, bang, 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 bang. And I'm feeling myself right now because I've been training with nice Singh, right? And Sam was like, yo, Bobby, stop hitting my arms so hard, yo. Seriously, stop hitting my arms, right? And I'm like, oh, no problem, Daigo. I'll take it easy, right? And in my mind, I'm like, oh, yeah, Sam will tell me don't hit him so hard. Yeah, let's get this going. So we do it again. Bop, 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 I'm feeling it. And she says, she says, Bobby, like, what, what what did I tell you? I'm like, yo, yo, I'm not going to tell you again. Stop hitting my arms so quick. Oh, no problem, Daigo. I got you. And now everybody on set is laughing, you know? They like, yo, so you keep playing around with him. You, you're gonna teach you a lesson or two, right? So we go to do it again. He says, uh, uh, cut, cut. So I, I, he says, oh, I got cheese so off. He said he had to go to the bathroom. He lied. He went around the corner. Around the corner, there was these huge metal rods. Huge, right? And he was sticking them in his arms. He just kept sticking them in his arms. So then he came back around the corner acting like, oof, oof. okay, I'm ready. Like he went to the bathroom. And then he said, oh, okay, eBay, and and as soon as he went action, you could hear it in my arm. It went boom, boom. I was like, oh, my God. Yo, instant lumps on my arms. He said, huh? You okay, Bobby? Huh? I told you, don't hit my arm so hard. So, yeah, that was a valuable lesson for me. Just share that with you real quick one. <laughs> what a great story. And he, and he knocked my tooth out. I don't know if you remember the police station scene where he grabs my head, lifts me up, and then knees me. Well, he knees me so freaking hard that uh, it knocked my tooth out. And... I'm bleeding from the mouth. He comes over. He says, "Bobby, Bobby, you okay?" Name I said, "Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm okay." I said, "My tooth. I spit my tooth out and all this blood." He said, "Yeah." He said, "Oh, yeah, your tooth, your tooth." Oh, I'm sorry, Bobby. Sorry. Okay, put it in your pocket, huh? Get, get Bobby water, water, water for Bobby. So he give me some water. He said, "Okay, you okay? Okay, let's go back to work, back to work." And I'm like, well, yeah. in my mind, I'm, yo, bro, I'm America. I need to see a dentist, bro. Like, I think we need to shut this down. Nah, bro, it's right back to work put that tooth in my pocket rinse my mouth out and it was right back to work man oh it was brutal man it was brutal it was brutal hong kong style is different and, and like you and i know it but a lot of americans don't really understand the depth of it you know what i mean what do you what do you think that is bobby you think that's uh is that just like hong kong grit is it the need to get things done because of productions and money what do you think that comes from I think it's because of um, just the way in which they 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 train. You know what I mean? Like the early days, like they they went through a lot of physical training to get to a certain level that they are. You know what I mean? And I think that translates in in how they design action and what they do. Um, and it's it's up to you to meet their standards. They don't dumb down for you. You you have to meet their standards. You know. Um, I use Don't Give a Damn as an opportunity to kind of join the Hong Kong Stumpers Association. There's a scene where I had to run across that field, jump over the thing, jump into the moving van. And I swear to God, they were dressing people up to look like me. And I just kept saying, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And uh, Sam was like, you can't do it. Get 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 the stunt guys ready. You're American, you know. But this is how they view up until a point. And I said, no, I can do it. So Yim Biao is cracking up. And never forget, it was Yim Biao. It was uh, Cho Wing. It was uh, um, La, uh, Lao Ka Wing. He was there that day. And you, in order to become a Hong Kong stuntman, you needed three signatures, action directors, prominent action directors, in order to just, you know, be considered to get in. Um, and so I said, I can do that stunt. And Samo would look, he was like, okay. I don't think you can, but if you can, sure, I'll sign for you to be a Hong Kong stuntman. I was like, seriously? I said, yeah. And then all the rest of them said, sure, yeah, we'll sign. We'll sign because they all thought I couldn't do it. They really did. They said 100 foot of track, you running out the burning building, running across the field, down onto the highway, over the 15 foot fence, into a moving van. Can't be done in one shot. Not in one shot. And uh, they called action and I did it. And let me tell you, after I did it, I'm looking at the, up at the hill. I mean, it was crickets. They were all like in shock that I could even pull it off, you know what I mean? And so I took four signatures in for the card, so. Congrats, it's a great Thanks. story. And that was and that was your email to me, I remember when I wrote the, uh, when I wrote the review about uh, Don't Give a Damn, you emailed me about that stunt, and I remember that. Yep, yep. 
Can you talk about uh real quick Lao Gawing's mm -hmm. role in Hungaban? Because you you know, he doesn't really pop up too often in films, but he's such an old timer with Shaw Brothers and then moving to Hongaban, mm -hmm. I guess, and the two of them mm -hmm. doing co-productions together. What was his role within Hongaban? So him and Samo are best friends. We're gonna leave the movies out of it. They're just best friends. And it translates with how you see them do films together. But first and foremost, it's the friendship. Um, and so a lot of times when Samo, like, don't give a damn, there were some scenes where Samo would leave and, and Lao Ka Wing would direct the scene. Um, that's the level of involvement that he has. You know what I mean? Um, he's he's Samo's, like, right hand. Like, if Samo walks away, we all know that Lao Ka Wing is the, is the person in charge, you know? Um, so that's history with them, too. They're just, they're brothers. Um, they're so close. Um, and it doesn't, it, it translates beyond the Hungaban, you know? It's just like, we know, in fact, Lao Ka Wing was very instrumental in making sure that, that Samo and Lao Ka Leung had that scene in Pedicab Driver, you know? Because Lao Ka Leung and him never really kind of worked together like that. Um, and Lao Ka Wing knew the significance of that, you know what I mean? And he kind of made sure that that, he was a catalyst in making sure that that happened, that they shared the screen, um, which go, goes without saying is probably <laughs> one of the highlights of both of their careers. Oh, that that action is is at a different level. When you really pay attention to that scene in Pedicab, just the levels of of skills that both of these men possess, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Did uh, did Lao Gaoing ever introduce you to uh, Lao Gaolong? So I did not get a chance to meet Lao Gaolong. I didn't. And I was actually supposed to meet him two on two separate occasions um, through Lao Ka Wing and also through Big Brother uh, Mark. Um, but I never really had a chance. And it's interesting because Sam, you know, Samo owned Take One Club. Uh, it's a club in Hong Kong. It's called Take One. It's where Nita Moy had her situation with the mob and everything. And uh, I never forget one night we went in there and um, Mark was in there. And I had never met Mark, but I had always known of Mark, you know, and I've seen Mark, his battles against Samo and everything. And I'm like, whoa, like he was the Western actor that like, no matter, I don't care how many Western actors are in Hong Kong, Mark is that goal with the American actors. You just have to call it for what it is. He laid the groundwork for us. You know what I mean? We would not be able to do what we do and be accepted if Mark did not really lay the foundation for us. Um, there have been American actors in, in in productions, but as far as the guy who set the tone for like what we do, you and me, Mark Harden is that guy. And you got to give him that respect. And how I knew how uh, who had his respect is when I went in there to the club that night, it was Samuel and I. And before we went upstairs, Sam was like, come on, when they introduce you to someone. And he introduced me to Mark. And he said, Mark, this is Bobby, Bobby, Mark. And then, uh, he said, Mark is very good, very popular in Hong Kong. And he said, Mark, I, I need you to take care of Bobby. Okay, no matter what, you, Bobby is my my guy. You take care of him. Don't let nothing happen to him. And I saw Mark's like, uh, he said, no problem, that girl. I got him. And I want to say close to 30 years later, Mark is still taking care of me. <laughs> you know, uh, no matter what, whatever I do, he supports me. Um, he sends me stuff from Hong Kong, you know, um, and he still looks after me. He kept his word to Samo. So for that, I love him dearly. And you have a shared, well, somewhat of a shared lineage of Hungar, right? Did that help you or was it a hindrance at all? Like what what, what did that look like when you were over there? Uh, no, actually it, it helped, you know? I mean, Hungar is, is my base, you know what I mean? And so like right now, like Mark Harden is Daigal as far as I'm concerned, you know what I mean? And in, in this business, he will always be big brother to me, you know? Um, and I learned from him, you know? He is the heir apparent to Lao Ka Leung's uh, Kung Fu lineage. Um, and so you have to give that the utmost respect. Um, and so in that respect, uh, I look at to him as one of my teachers now, you know what I mean? Just in life in general and in, in this business, he is, he's my big brother. You touched briefly on um, 
organized crime activity with Anita Mui at the club and whatnot. And yeah. we, all, we all remember that story. Um, were there any other episodes that you encountered of organized crime in Hong Kong? Yeah, there, there really was. So, but what happened to me, I, well, I'll share a quick story. So just to let you know how it works. Uh, Samo knows people. <laughs> I'll just say that. He knows people. I'm not saying he's part of anything, but he's respected. We'll just leave it at that. Um, I was in a club one night in Hong Kong, and uh, a ship came in with a lot of Americans. And when the ship came in, they, they were at the clubs as well, you know, and I'll never forget. I didn't, I, you know, I talked to the girls in there, that kind of thing, you know, and um, I guess they were mad because a lot of the girls were around me, but I, I frequent the club a lot. So they kind of knew me. I lived in Hong Kong, right? So a lot of the Navy, Navy guys are like, yo, why is this why boy over here taking all the girls? And, you know, and then some of them were a tad racist. We'll, we'll just say that, you know, I did hear the N word a couple of times and uh, I kind of flagged them on like they were nothing. And I continued on about my business. But like I wasn't really friends with like the the, the club owner or anything like that, you know. So then I um I stayed for a little bit longer, but I noticed they kept watching. me. I noticed they just kept watching me. Um, and then I, and then one guy said that, you know, we'll see you when you're leaving. So now I'm a little nervous leaving the club because I'm, all, I'm by myself, you know, and it's like about 13, 14 of them, you know, and I know how it works when you get the liquor in you and you get brave and, you know, you're on R and R. Um, so I, I knew I was going to be a target. So as I'm getting up to go and leave, one of the waiters said they, they three of them already left the outside waiting for you. I was like, okay, no worries, you know? So I already knew in my mind that I, I, I was probably gonna have to fight, you know. I step out the club as I'm uh, as I'm walking. I saw where they were. I went the opposite way. As I'm walking, I could hear them yelling at me and everything. And then the rest of them came out. Mm -hmm. But what I did, and I turned back and I'm looking at them, right? And they're saying, yeah. But then I noticed they stopped talking. And then I'm looking at them like, so which say whatever whatever it is you say, say, right? But then I noticed that. I heard something behind me saying, do lay low more. We all know what that means, right? And when I turned around, there were 20 Asian guys with baseball bats and bayonets. And that ended it. I didn't know these guys from a paint, but they knew that I was with Samo. And they knew that I was not to be touched. And they were about to make sure that I wasn't touched. And at that point, that's when I knew what level of the game this thing really was. That's crazy. Honestly, got truth. Honestly, got truth. I read a book about. Uh, it's called the Hung Society, and mm -hmm. uh, there is this overlap between Hungar and triads. Not that it's always organized crime, that it was just mm -hmm. an organization. Mm -hmm. I think that might be, I mean, maybe there's a misconception here that you could touch on. Um, but from what I understand is that like, it's not simply like mafia, right? It's, mm -hmm. that's not, that's not it. Can you, can you, can you help elucidate this? Like 14 K very popular in Hong Kong. That's one of the triad sex. Very, very popular. Um, Charles Hill, Helm Wakel, he's a made guy. Chen Wa Min, a lot of you remember him. He's a made guy. Um, so, like, as with anything organized crime, it's it exists. It exists. How much it exists? I mean, you could say it's the equivalent of uh, members. What's his uh, Stephen Seagal in NASA? Money with his films and you know that sort of thing it exists it exists now during the 80s it was like really run by them i'll just say that um they wanted they wanted a cut of everything everything you know andy lau as you already know he had big problems uh there were a lot of very well-known actors that knew that the payoff had to be given you know and a lot of the, the movies were funded by them as well. That's that's another thing, you know, that's where the Iron Grip came because they had the money to fund these films. So along with that funding of the films, you know, well, we pretty much own you, you know. 
And that's how the early days of the business was was ran, you know? It wasn't until like people started resisting, like a Muying Fong, which we all know what happened. Um, the guy slapped her in the club. Well, you know, he ended up taking a dirt nap. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but slowly but surely when people started we're like standing up and like, no, we're not going to have this. This is going to be a legitimate type of thing. You started to see the paradigm change um, with different money sources coming in and the films were no longer being funded by the, I'll just say organizations, that there were different aspects of where the, the funding could come from. Um, even if it came from China, funneled into Hong Kong, that, that well means that the organizations aren't in control. You know what I mean? Um, and so the organizations can't really battle with China. You you see where the paradigm shift I'm talking about? So yeah, you could be mad that China is now funding the films that you used to do, but what are you going to do about it? Not a damn thing. Because it's like, my gang is bigger than your gang. I'll just say it like that. And you know, I'm using euphemisms. But because I don't want to kind of like earmark anything and have people quote me on, well, you said the triad, but you understand exactly what I'm saying. It's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, that must have been part and parcel to like the Deng Xiaoping reforms and, mm -hmm. you know, mainland Chinese money coming south, Hong Kong money going north. Um, yep. So I guess uh, I, I guess Jackie Chan was also one of those um, early adopters, so to mm -hmm. speak, where he. Uh, yeah. he was... well, well, Jackie read the tea leaves early, you know. And a lot of the the Hong Kong people who, you know, of course, China promised 50 years of autonomy. Um, but the minute that they started really acting up, I'll just say that, China immediately thumb, 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 you know, that's how it works. You know what I mean? They only promised a certain group of people passports. You know, Sam was fortunate to get British passports for him and his family, you know, uh, to have somewhere else to go. But a lot of people weren't that lucky and they knew that the iron thumb was on them. And so they had to kind of work within that, that, that paradigm. And as you see, things are, have just totally shifted in Hong Kong now. On that note, let's go to America as mm -hmm. many Hong Kong filmmakers, stars. Um, also they went to Australia, mm -hmm. Europe to make films. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you come back to America also. And, um, you work on films like The Corrupter. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, tell us about your American journey now, which is, you know, paradoxically like stage two of your career. Yeah, yeah. So like for me, it was a it was a it was a it's a pretty cool transition because I went from Kung Fu movies to like directing music videos for a lot of the, the, the current artists, you know, DMX, Metallica. I did Whiskey in a Jar with Metallica. Um, I did most deaf. I did a lot of music videos and then I ended up doing Drew Hill stuff. Um, and so from there, I started doing a lot of second unit directing work uh, for a lot of uh, independent films and things of that nature. Um, I knew Chow in Hong Kong and then I knew that he was going to be filming um, Corrupter. Um, that was already cast and everything, but he's like, no, no, I need you. I need you. I need you. So I was his assistant basically uh, on that production. Um, and wherever he went, I went, that sort of thing, you know, made sure that everything he needed was taken care of. Um, but it afforded me an opportunity, you know, to, to, and it, it showed, he felt comfortable with me because although he was working in America, he recognized somebody that is American, but knows Hong Kong, knows Guangdong, um, and it made it more comfortable for him, you know? um truly a superstar of epic proportion like there's nowhere in new york city that this guy could walk and just not get mobbed it was like he was royalty uh during that time um so yeah i was fortunate in that respect um and again after i did the music videos the second unit directing a lot of small films you know i started thinking about you know doing my own thing as a, like a director, you know? That was one thing Samo said, well, like, what do you want to do? Do you just want to do martial arts films? And I said, I want to be a director. And so on Don't Give a Damn, 
he would call me over and he'd be like, Bobby, look, look through the viewfinder. This I use this lens for this reason. I did this for this reason. You know, I set the shot up here this particular way. And so that was the best education. You know, when it came to editing, he was still editing on the Steinbeck machines. Uh, he had them in his office and I would sit there at night with him while he was editing the action and he would show me how to splice and put things together. And like for me, uh, like no amount of film school would be able to teach me the on hands. So I didn't go to film school. My partner, who I've been with for 35 years, he graduated from NYU. And that was the deal. You go and get the book knowledge. I got the the general education on how this works. And we'll meet once once you graduate. I uh, know Robert Jefferson, he graduated college. Um, he's got his film degree from NYU. But my tutelage is on hands experience working with I'll just say the Spielberg of Asia, you know what I mean? Um, and by working with him, the other aspect was living with him in his home, you know? That gave me one up on most everyone else, you know? A lot of Western actors, they only work with Samo, you know? I, in turn, lived in his home with him and shared a bedroom with his son, you know? So that's a, a different kind of relationship and education um, to be involved in, you know what I mean? So from that Everyone said, oh, well, you don't shoot like Samuel. You don't do this or that. One thing Samuel taught me, he was like, make sure your characters, characters are everything. Make sure your characters are interesting because the audience will live vicariously through the characters. If you notice all his films, every one of them have characters that just, they just stand out. So when I, when I create characters, that's always first in mind. I remember what Samuel taught me. The character is what the audience is going to live through. So you have to create the most interesting character. Um, as far as action is concerned, he always told me that the, the camera is the, the third arm in a fight scene. Um, so you have the actors, but the camera has to be just as powerful as the actors doing the action. And so that's where the marriage comes in. You know, Now, whenever I do action, I always view the camera as the third arm in the fight scene. It's just, you know, that, that kind of education doesn't get taught at, at NYU. It can only be taught from the master, you know what I mean? And I paid attention to everything that he taught me. One thing I didn't want to do is I didn't want to do films that look like Samo because that, to me, that's that doesn't show originality and that doesn't show growth and it doesn't really pay homage to Samo in any respect. It's like I'm trying to like fight what he does and did and I'm not going to do that. What I wanted to do was kind of create my own own style of of action with Hong Kong style with my American sensibilities and just my overall creative vibes on how I do things so and and I knew that and I knew that in order to really round out things I had to kind of partner up with a lot of today's younger talent younger talent because you see the advent of digital film it kind of changed everything so now these young people have access to putting materials out and things of that nature. And some of it is brilliant. I really must say some of it is brilliant. Um, and for me, in order to keep my career, how can I say, like current, I knew that I kind of had to kind of like breathe in some of this youth that's around me, breathe in some of the ideas that they have, kind of let go of some of the traditional ways in which the old style of filmmaking and incorporate the newer aspect of what these young, that's Bobby Samuels' way. I, I was going to say that you uh, you learned from Samo very well there too, because that was definitely a Samo hung tactic where went from, I mean, talk about going the gamut from Shaw Brothers and Golden Harvest era you know, traditional choreography to, you know, what he was doing in the uh, early 90s. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, but uh, yeah, you definitely are making it your own thing. When you came to America and you tried to, when you started applying these filmmaking principles that Samo taught you, uh, what was it like doing that in America? Um, it, it was a little difficult at first because the Americans have a certain way in which they just film, you know? Um, you deal with the unions and things of that nature, and, you know, you got to deal with SAG, and there's just so many different things that you kind of have to pay attention to on this side that you never really had to pay attention to on the other side, you know? Um, certain safety elements that have to be adhered to here in the United States as opposed to 
how we used to just cardboard box it up and throw your ass off a roof. Uh, you know what I mean? That's how that works. Excuse my language. Um, so now, yeah, I, I kind of got some looks in America like, uh, Bobby, we can't really, uh, you got to be careful and uh, you got to, well, why not? You know, that's me, you know, but I, I kind of had to respect the system and understand how it works, you know, because you got people, films are bonded now in insurance and, you know, you can't risk the actor and this and that. And it just, that's, that's how it is, you know. But with that being said, because my indoctrination into film business was, again, in Hong Kong, not in the U.S., I, the U.S. is the second portion, you know what I mean? So that was a OJT to learn this style over here, you know. But, you know, throughout the years, I've been very fortunate, you know. I've been very, very lucky. Um, and I can still I, I still do films, you know. I'm, I'm, my first film was 1990 with Gambling Ghosts. And my last film, I, you know, I did a, I did Made in Chinatown, you know. For me, that, that, that American film, I had a $2 million budget for that, uh, Made in Chinatown. Um, that was um that was different for me because like that film forced me to kind of feed a number of appetites. I wasn't going to make everybody happy with that film. It it was a family film. It was brought to me as a family film. No cursing. Um, martial arts was secondary to the story of it. You know, it had eight of the Soprano alumni in it: Vinnie Pastora, Tony Darrow, Tony Ray Rossi, all the alumni. Uh, Chris Chris uh, um. Uh, uh, can't think of his name right now um, from um, Tulsa right now with um, Chris Calavino. That's who he is. He's playing opposite Stallone now in uh, uh, Tulsa, the TV series. Um, but just working with those A-list actors, I knew that I couldn't just make this a Hong Kong film. But where I got, I'm not going to say I got in trouble, where some people didn't like is a lot of the Hong Kong diehard fans of cinema they wanted to see Chuchi Lane doing this and Lo Mong doing Lion versus Lion and all that. These guys are in their seventies, bro. They're in their seventies. They're not going to be able to do that type of action anymore. It's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? Um, but you have to respect them and you have to do, you have to introduce, introduce their characters and you have to do enough so that they're, they're being respected on, on film. Um, so whereas it satisfied the, the, the comedy element and the mainstream, it didn't satisfy the martial arts aficionados, you know, but again, I, I wasn't making the film for the martial arts aficionados, you know, and I just, because that as a director, you have to be able to do so much. You have to have an eclectic style. You have to have, you can't be typecast into one type of a vision and it knows it's got to be this color action. It's got to be all this hardcore. No, it's not it. That's not what the film calls for. And a savvy director knows how to read those temperature marks, knows how to make those subtle adjustments in order to, to, to bring the, the project to light, you know? So when you, when you work on these indie film projects um, mm -hmm. and you've worked on some that are, you know, collaborations like with Joey Min yeah. um, and you've done your own as well, Shadow Fist. Mm -hmm. um, what is your action design process ideally? Um, ideally what I'll do is I, I, I action design pretty much like the Hong Kong way. And it hasn't let me down in the past. And I know there are a number of ways in which people do things now, okay? Um, a lot of the younger guys, they like to do a lot of pre this okay? All of that is great, okay? To kind of give you a basic skeletal structure of what you need to do. But that can't compensate for the organic aspect of the action. See, because when you do pre visits sometimes your action tends to look prearranged. In some way, it looks prearranged. You can't lose sight of the fact that you got to keep that that modicum of realis realism, that modicum of, of, of not so choreographed, that it's offbeat and it's sloppy and it's, you know, out of sync and blurry and tight. And you, 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 you can't keep it clean, you know. And I find that that a lot of times that a lot of the younger filmmakers like, well, we, we pre this and some pre that. OK, yeah, that's that's all great. You know, Samuel will walk into a room, stand there and look for 30 seconds, figure out what needs to be done, design the action on the spot, get the cameras in there and film the scene. 
it wasn't storyboarded. It wasn't pre -vised. It came from his skull. I watched Yin Muping do the same thing. Now, nowadays they use certain things with the pre -vised and everything because it's different now. You know what I mean? Now, now with the advent of the way cell phones are now, you can really use them to your advantage because they can almost operate as the camera itself from the amount of five, six lenses on one camera. You know what I mean? You can make, make, make do with what you need, but uh, never lose sight of, of, of your foundation. Okay. What if you didn't have all that? It would have to come from here. And so sometimes that's, that's where I'm at now. That's what I do. I do a lot of that. Now I do work with uh, pre business. I'll explain something. I'll take a look at the previous. I'm not married to the previous. The previous kind of gives me a blueprint. Okay, I see what I need to do here. So. And so, like, what am I trying to say? Because I work the same way. Um, previs, without getting into my opinions too much, tends to look like fights on a Persian rug because they, yeah, uh, call, they call them Persian rug fights. They don't seem to exist mm -hmm. actually where they're being shot. Um, do you think that the likes of Samo and Yumo Ping and anybody who does it on the spot, is there an element of pressure making greatness, the pressure to deliver on the spot with a short time, with short time frame, the whole crew standing there? Mm. Is there an element of that that helps you when you're designing action? Uh, yes, yes. It does. Again, the American tempo is different now. You know what I mean? Um, I'll I'll watch the previous. like we have an action team. They'll they'll come in with their little previous and everything. I'll read this concept. I'll say, okay, I like this part. I don't like that. That feels prearranged. That feels gimmicky. Uh, I don't like how you use the camera right here. That sort of thing. Um, and I'll let them go through the motions. But then ultimately, I'll make the adjustments on where I think the enhancements need to go. And I think that that's where a lot of the creative energies are lost these days. Like, stop feeling like you need to just blueprint your pre -biz. That's not, that doesn't give you the, the right look and feel. That that feels prearranged. And that's the part that I try to get a lot of young filmmakers, you know, I've been in this for, for a minute. I try to tell them, but they want to stick to, you know, I guess it's the the the, the schooling of, of how it is these days. And and it's almost like you see the 12 foot of water, but you're afraid to kind of just jump in. Boom. You can see the ledge. You can you can swim to the edge and, and get back out, but jump in. You know, stop. It doesn't have to be safe. Jump in. And I think that that right there is somewhat lost in some respects. However, Big brother Andy does that a lot now. He really knows how to like dig in. And again, you see what he he does. He, he takes those old sensibilities, but he also brings in that, breathes in that youth, that new, that energy. Marshall Club been around for a long time. They've been doing a bunch of stuff, you know? No one ever gave him a shot. I've always said, that's the group to watch out for. I said that. I said, there's something, they they have something that's different than everyone else. And once it's captured correctly and the masses see it, it'll it'll just it'll take off like flies, you know what I mean? Because there's just some that have that 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 creative energy and they don't rely on previouses, they kind of do it organically. So uh where do you see the Hong Kong and I guess by extension Chinese action mm -hmm. film industry going right now? So I'll say this, I'll say that I'm glad that, so American action back in the day, you you know, it was punch, block, overhead, duck, John Wayne, gut shot, push him out the way, bottle over the head, all of that. Yeah, that that's all cool and well. Um, but once America started embracing um, a lot of that talent from Asia, it kind of revolutionized the way in which, it, and that it goes from Marvel on up and down. It kind of, revol you can't say any action film these days of quality that don't have some piece of that element from the, the from the early days of Hong Kong or, you know what I mean? 
just what we do in general, uh, that style of action. It, it's almost like you don't, you, there's no going back. The John Wayne punch, John Wayne punches is that's over with. That's over with the bar, the bar brawls. You can't just do a simple bar brawl like that anymore. It's gotta be, it's gotta be visceral. Like take um into the Badlands, one of my greatest series uh, as far as I'm concerned that's ever parlayed American in in Hong Kong. Andy put his thing down with that series. There's a, the the red haired uh, woman, the widow, um, the scene in the bar when she goes into the bar, um, and the guys are in there, and that that one scene where she just like lays waste to everybody. That's how it's got to be done. It's it, it. There's no longer any of that. You see, you walk into a bar and you punch here, you'll block, I'll throw you into the table, the table will break away and all that's out the window, you know? So now I've watched your stuff over the years. You were one of the ones who impressed me the most in the independent world because like you were an inspiration to me on the independent scene because like I was like, I know what I want. I know how it has to be done, but there's really nobody out here really doing it that way. But then you came out with your stuff. And I was like, wow, this guy's this guy's different. This guy's like, he knows exactly how it's done. The, 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 the concepts were thought out. The action was organic. Um, there was a certain sense of risk with the action. Um, just the overall way in which you captured everything is like you paid attention to your Hong Kong roots, but then again, you gave it that 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 breath of uh, of creativity that reads, hmm, well, it's not quite Hong Kong. You know what I mean? It's his own little spin on there. So for that, I'm I'm really like, I'm very appreciative of you in that respect, bro. And like, you've done some work over the years that I paid uh, tremendous attention to, trust me. Especially when you were the blind guy, I was like, wow, that's, that's, that's different, you know? And I've always uh, wanted to have this kind of a conversation with you. Um, so really, I, I'm very appreciative that you you give me this opportunity. Oh, thanks, Bobby. That's that's huge. Like I said, it's uh, uh, it's all inspired by, you know, video CDs from, you know, Chinatown shops where they, they wanted to get rid of these things. So I'd buy a hundred of them at a time. So, uh, yeah, that was my schooling. So and thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, like one of the important things for for me was mentorship because my mentor is a uh, Clayton Barber <clears throat> who has a, you know, major Hong Kong film nerve, good nerve in his body. Cause he did blade and yeah. um, you know, he did martial law. He worked mm -hmm. on all that spillover stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he understood this, you know, the Hong Kong style, but he knew that, the, you know, we're American, like we're going to make an American movie. And that's why, exactly. you know, when he directed, he directed, directed blindsided as a, uh, it's a Zatoichi homage. So there's Japanese yeah. in there, but there's yeah. the Hong Kong kind of style of action in there yeah. too. Um, but it's sort of kind of what Samo is, what Samo told you, which is that, you know, it's character story mm -hmm. and that's, that's everything. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, you know, what, what I, what I appreciate about what you're doing with, you know, shadow fist and in, in these is that you're, you're, you're doing the indie style, you're doing the indie world because that's the way that you can do it. Mm hmm I mean, there's this sort of limitation naturally when you work on a fifty million dollar Hollywood oh, yeah. film. Absolutely. How are you going to? How are you going to make this fight scene sell? It's almost like it's almost like that American bar brawl style comes out of that mm -hmm. studio system where you need it planned out. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you people are going to be annoyed right. that you're taking so long. I did a um, I did a short uh, last year called uh, Jugando con Fuego. I did that down in Mexico and uh, I did that for, for a reason. I did that because like I've co-starred with a number of actors for many, many years, you know, and I never really got the bump as a lead actor. And I said to myself, you know what? Well, it's the same th feeling that I had when I wanted to get into the business. You know, you have to go out there and create opportunities for yourself. So I found this director, his, Nick, his name is Nicholas Ortiz, and he did uh, Black Betty, he did a couple things out there, and they, they kind of, his visual style, he's a professor at NYU, actually, he teaches film, um, and it was just something about what he did, and like, I said, you know, this guy's got an eye, let me see what I can do, and so we all decided to say, look, we can keep toiling away and doing this and doing that, you do your thing, I do my thing, and all this, but 
I think that what we have is something unique where we can kind of work together. Um, and we came up with the story idea. We allowed him to kind of, Robert Jefferson and I, we allowed him to write the script. He wrote the script. We got the script back. We read it. Wow. Um, at that point, um, we said, well, none of them had ever been to Mexico. And I said, well, this is what it's like down there. The wonderful people. The infrastructure is good. The dollar value is good. And so everybody just said, F it. We all put our funds together. And we said, we'll fund this film ourselves. And we went for three weeks. We, we left, went to Mexico. Um, and it was the greatest decision we ever did. I mean, I've won, I won Best Actor for that in New York recently. And uh, we won pretty much every award across the, the country, the world rather. Um, but that the reason I say that is because like, I'm not gonna sit around and wait for an opportunity. I do big films, I do small films. I just did a film with uh, Keith David and Bruce Davis and Academy Award winners, you know? But again, I respect my craft. So I don't really look at it like, you know, who I do a big budget film and I only do this type of film. No, I'm a filmmaker. So it doesn't matter, you know, I'm, I got money of my own, you know, through my investments throughout the, so it's never about the dollar value. It's always about the vision. So if a young person comes to me and says, you know, I want to do this and I'll hear what they have to say. And if they say they don't have a budget or their budget is low, I'll say, well, what's, what do you have to work with? And then if I believe in them, if I believe in the project, I'll work within that structure. I, and I'm never, again, gambling goes, net money could have cost me everything. And that's the guiding principle of how I roll. And that's how come I've been able to work in A-list films, B-list films, and vice versa, and independent films, and do my own thing, and continue. I, I haven't skipped a beat. There hasn't been a, a year that I haven't done a film since I started. It's all because I remain humble. I, I respect people, and I'm willing to work with people. You know what I mean? I, I think that a lot of my creative energies come through others, you know? So that's how I that's how I operate now. And listen, I got to get you in a film. I was actually, I talked to Robert Goldman. He's um one of Cynthia's producers on uh, Black Creek. And uh, he said he was in. I thought about something. I said, you know what? It's while we're all still alive, you know what I mean? I mean, Stallone had a good, good, good idea with The Expendables. Thought that was a little, little brilliant thing. I think that that could be done for the martial arts community as well. Um, and the, and what you do is you, you use us and then you usher in the newer talents, you know, along with that story idea. And if we could just get everybody to, you know, squash the Eagles and come in a scale and get it done, Billy Blanks, you, me, we'll bring the martial club. You know what I mean? It's just different gender. It's something that I believe martial arts aficionados would enjoy watching something like that. You can call it the doubles about a bunch of like washed up uh, martial artists who uh, realize that they need stunt doubles in order to accomplish a big heist. <laughs> right. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yo. All right. I think you got some there. I think you got some. I'll be one of the washed up guys. Yep. Me too. <laughs> Dude. Uh, yeah. Uh, so like last career question. And I have one more after that. Um, sure. What advice do you have for the new generation of people coming into the action film industry? Uh, very good, very good, very good question. So, um, some may not like what I say, some may like what I say. I'll just, I'll just say it. I've been, I've always been brutally honest that way. Um, I think a lot of young talent these days are, they want the glory, but they don't want to put the work in. And they, and I think that if they work on like a Gotham or if they work on, you know, this other big show and this Marvel film here, I think they feel like because they say they're a part of that, you know, the stunt crew that, that puts them at a certain level. And I think that, you know, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself because by you being a stunt person in this film, the, you're not going to stand out against a $110 million film with A-list actors making $30, $40 million paychecks. I don't care what you did in it. You're not going to stand out. So the only thing that's going to, you got to say, hey, look at me. I was in, I was in, I was in. But that's, to me, that's the wrong, that's the wrong thing. I'll say this. I'm SAG when I pay my dues. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what I've accomplished in life was not through SAG. Sometimes you don't 
have to depend on the system to get you where you need to do. You just have to dig deep, be creative, think outside of the box and make your mark. Um, so a lot of times when they call and they'll say, you know, well, are you SAG or not? I say, well, when I pay my dues, if I don't pay my dues then whatever, you know what I mean? Because a lot of times I don't want to pay my dues because there might be some projects that I, I don't want to be beholden to the union for and those rules. So I'll let it lapse. Okay. I do what I do. You know what I mean? But that's just me because I don't want the system to be able to dictate to me what I can do. I, you know, I was self-made up until um, made in Chinatown. I've, I've gotten this far, 25 years, a name without ever joining SAG. How I joined SAG was I wrote myself a role into uh, made in Chinatown. And I did a speaking role and there you go. I got my, uh, myself in, you know, but again, did I need that? No, that was just a sense of accomplishment for me to say, okay, I did it. Eh, whatever. You know what I mean? But I did it, but I didn't need it to get where I'm at. I just think that a lot of actors don't need to just like latch on to saying, I was in Marvel. I, was in, I think you need to go out there and find the most creative way in which to show your skill set, be it on a Marvel, be it on an Andy Lee or Joey Mann or John Truy level. You know, those guys are talented, bro. Like they're really talented. They just need the opportunity, you know? Um, so that's the only thing I say, you know? Now I'm working with some guys, you know, they are SAG, but a lot of times when I call them, they say F SAG. I'm, I'm on board simply behind just you and the creative way and what we're going to do and this and that, you know? Because another thing is, you know, although you may say certain films are independent and that they, they don't, like they're not out there in the mainstream, what they can offer you is a is a good scene, a good body of work. Whereas if you want to go and get those jobs, hey, look at this fight scene. And now, hey, you didn't did this little small fight scene, like my nephew, Terrell Cota Bullock, you know what I mean? This little fight scene. And now somebody didn't seen that little fight scene. And now look at you. You're on Zodiac. You're on Warrior. You're, you know, you're this guy. You're talking about the second coming, you know, so don't don't look down on those independent films simply behind the, the fact that they have no no budget and like they have nothing to offer you. What they cannot, and I'll tell people in a minute, I have a small budget. I can transport you, I can feed you, but what I can promise you is that if I'm gonna use you, I'm gonna give you an art piece of of, of footage that you can put on your reel. And like, there's no no amount of money in the world that can compensate for that. You know what I mean? And I'll give them a kick ass action sequence. You know what I mean? Whereas you wouldn't get that in a in a studio setting in a just as a as a SAG day player or, or whatever. You know what I mean? You don't get that standout thing that's gonna make people take notice of you. You you get the group ensemble piece, sure. That's that's very doable. But what about you? But again, it depends on who what level people want to be and what they want to do in this business. You know, some people are happy just doing stunts, you know, and taking taking shots. But a stuntman's life is short lived. You're only as good as your body lasts. You know what I mean? For me, I started as an actor. So I knew, you know, my steely good looks as a young guy would get me places. But as I got older, I realized, wait a second, I'm getting older. There are a lot of other young people out here that look better than me. So what am I going to keep thinking I'm the lead man, good looking guy? No, I got to mature with everything else. So then I stopped concentrating on the younger roles and started, oh, I want to play the older cop. I want to play this, you know what I mean? Or, or now I don't want to do that. I just want to concentrate on directing and acting and things of that nature. You know, you got to constantly update yourself and upgrade yourself in that respect. So my, my steely good looks never got me anywhere. I, I, I was always told I have a, I have a great face for motion capture. So uh, that's, that's the route I, I took. Uh, are you nothing uh, wrong with that. <laughs> nothing wrong looking like that. But I just, but you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I just don't want these young guys to be in love with, I did a Marvel film or I was in such and such. I was this and that. But if you're, if, if you're not talked about in the trades, you know, that was always a parameter for me. If I'm not on entertainment tonight, then I need to work. That's just as simple as that, you know? So. Um, are you a family man? Or are you a father? I am. I have a uh, daughter. What, uh, what is it like being a, uh, in the action film industry and being a father for you? Wow, that's interesting. Um, it's different because, you know, I wanted 
I really wanted my daughter to go into martial arts, but she's actually a, a school teacher, you know, and the irony is that she was, uh, I'll never forget, I was coming from Hong Kong one day and I said to myself, I said, God, before I die, please just give me a daughter, you know, I just want a daughter. And not only did he give me one, he gave me one on my birthday. And I was born at 6.34 p.m. She was born at 6.34 a.m. So it's like she's a godsend, you know. Um, but she's not really into, like, movies, per se, different generation, things of that nature, you know. But one thing she does know is that this is my life. And I'm very passionate about what I do. And, like, I was filming yesterday. When I say I got to go film, they just, it, that's daddy and what he does, you know. He's been doing it for so long. So it's acceptable in that respect. My mother, she still worries a lot, you know. She's like, oh, well, you're not, you're not young anymore. Now, none of us are young anymore, but, you know. Um, Father time catches everyone, you know. But I try to tell young people, you know, it's not, it's, uh, it's not the date you get here because that's already written. You know when your birthday is. I know when mine is. It's not the date you leave. That's been written. No one knows that. Everyone's scared of that one. Where you'll be judged is the line that connects both points. That's where your legacy is, in that line that connects both points. And that's how I've always operated in trying to make that line the most respectful piece of history that I can leave as a legacy, not only to my family, but to people that have supported me throughout the years, you know, and to show them that a kid from the ghetto, look what happened with me. I managed to make it right beside Jackie and Samo and yun and all them. And, and, and like, so if I can do it, anybody can do it. But I didn't do it through wanting people to give me anything. I did it through just sheer hard work and determination and a lot of sacrifices, you know, a lot of sacrifices to, to, to get where you are. And then, you know, I've tried to help people over the years and, Sometimes that backfires in your face. Sometimes you make enemies. Sometimes people are, you know, the proverbial uh, sins, as 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 the good book says, jealousy, envy, and, and all those other things, you know. But I think as long as you keep your moral compass straight and you don't feed into the I'm a superstar thing, um, I think that's the road to success a person who's able to handle life in those terms you know and i get it i get it sometimes i get a lot of feedback from my manager and my agent um my business partner they'd be like yo bro you can't do this all you can't you can't just call people you can't just give people your phone number you can't just be accessible like that uh because you know sometimes it's to my detriment but i i try to you know i'm that guy where i just want my fans to have access to me and to, to let them know that it's not about ego. It's about, I'm a normal guy. I'm willing to have a conversation with you. I'm willing to take a photo with you. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. Um, yeah, just just remain humble. And that's, that, and that's what kept me moving to this day. Well, uh, you've done a, a, a great service in your career. And uh, this, uh, this episode has also been a, a huge honor. So thank you for talking to all of us. Oh, I could talk to you for hours, bro. And again, man, it's you. It's, you gave me the spirit to do what I do now on the independent scene. And you are that, you you took that title. So the, only, the reason why I'm doing these independent shorts and things of that nature was because I watched what you and the stunt people did. I really appreciate it, Bobby. Um, this has been a joy. Thank you. I appreciate that.